Welcome, fellow explorers. My name is Christian Alexanderson, and this is Hemlocks to Hellbender, a podcast highlighting Pennsylvania's parks, forests, and great outdoors. When a hunter enters a forest with their bow or gun, there's a good chance they won't get a deer. The new gear purchases, their early morning wake-ups, and all the time spent waiting in a blind will be for naught. In fact, only 22% of hunters took an antler deer in 2022, according to the Pennsylvania Game Commission. So, you'd expect those few who were able to successfully hunt a deer to keep the meat for themselves, to feed their families and fill their freezers with venison they harvested. But that's not the case. Every year, hundreds of thousands of pounds of venison are donated to hunters sharing the harvest. This nonprofit processes and distributes donated meat from the hunters to hungry people around Pennsylvania. The donated meat goes to local food banks and charitable organizations in local and rural communities to the benefit of hungry men, women, and families throughout the Commonwealth. What started out as a small nonprofit program in Pennsylvania has evolved into the preferred nationally recognized model other states now replicate. It's a success story built on kindness, generosity, charity, and volunteerism. Now, how can you not love that? I'm excited to welcome Randy Ferguson to the podcast. Randy is the executive director of Hunters Sharing the Harvest. Randy, thanks for joining the program. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Can you tell us about Hunters Sharing the Harvest? When was the program created? What do you do? Uh, Hunter Sharing the Harvest is Pennsylvania's venison donation program. So we were started back in 1991 by a couple of gentlemen by the name of John Plowman and Kenny Brandt. John Plowman was an employee of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Uh, Mr. Brandt was actually a state representative. And the two of them really just wanted to create an organization that would kind of formalize some of what had already been done for many years, uh, sort of as a one-off type of situation where state game wardens and others uh, that maybe had confiscated deer, mistake kills, things like that, they would make sure those deer got processed and then they would uh, uh, they would give those deer, the venison from those deer to local families that could use it or soup kitchens. So it was just kind of being done, uh, but it wasn't done under any sort of formal type of organization. And these gentlemen thought there's probably a way we could do this uh, where we could actually include hunters as well that wanted to donate venison. So uh, really, the rest of the the rest of it is history. At that point, we've been doing this for 32 years, and we've really become a nationally emulated uh, venison donation program. How many pounds of meat has been donated since the program's inception? We estimate right now about two and a half million pounds have been donated over the course of these 32 years. Wow! Uh, the first decade or so. Uh, some of our records for pounds aren't as accurate as we'd like, but we've been able to to extrapolate uh, the a pretty good estimate for that first decade, and we do have hard numbers for the last 20 or so years. So, so yeah, two and a half million pounds is our estimate right now. How much meat is donated annually, and like, what's your latest numbers from the from the last season? Yeah, so we've had an annual goal of 100,000 pounds of venison to be donated, and we've had that goal in place pretty much from day one. And really for the last eight years or so, uh, we've been eclipsing that goal of $100,000 or 100,000 pounds from year to year. Last year was actually a record-breaking year for us, and it was actually uh, the largest venison donation numbers in the country were reported here in Pennsylvania. We had a total of 235,532 pounds of venison donated, and that was from a total of 6,201 deer and four elk. <laughs> I think you're going to have to start increasing those numbers of what you think you're going to be getting soon. Yeah, we probably need to reevaluate our goals. <laughs> we're making it too easy on ourselves right now. Yeah, a good problem to have. Right, right. How many meals does an average size deer create? So the way we quantify that meal figure, we we uh, we consider it as servings because obviously uh, a meal that contains venison isn't, you know, the venison isn't the meal itself. So we look at servings. So the way we quantify that is we use uh, a formula based on the American Heart Association's recommendation of about three ounces of lean red meat in a serving. Uh, and so when you calculate that out, the average deer, and this holds true across Pennsylvania and a lot of the other states here in the east, we usually yield about 35 to 40 pounds of usable venison uh, out of each average deer. So when you do that math uh, on each of those on 35 to 40 pounds, you're going to average somewhere around 200 plus servings of venison. So when we look at a year like last year where we had 235,000 pounds of venison donated around the state, 
we can calculate that that equates to somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1.24 million servings of venison that we're helping to feed the hungry last year alone. It's not every day that someone can land a deer. What's the pitch you would make to encourage people to donate the meat rather than keep it for themselves? Well, actually, the way we approach that is our philosophy is that, frankly, you should take care of your own family's needs first. So when hunters go out in the field, we we tell them, you know, if, if your family's going to consume two deer in a year and between you and a son or a daughter or whoever in your family uh, can put those first two deer in the freezer and then secure what your family needs for the year, then from there, as you're filling extra tags throughout the season, and we encourage you to take advantage of extra tags, then consider donating those deer. And that's really, that's always been my sales pitch. You know, it, it's, we do still recognize that hunters are out there uh, for primarily the purpose of feeding their families. So we want you to do that first. We just want you to then consider your neighbors, people that you don't know uh, that may be struggling and in need of food assistance to then, to then donate deer through our program. And we try to make it as easy as possible for them to do that. Okay, someone shot a deer and wants to donate it. Talk us through the process. It's a pretty simple process. Uh, the way our model works is we have about 100 participating processors around the state. So we have a pretty good saturation throughout the state, although there are a lot of areas where we're in desperate need of processors. But to get back to the question, the process works by the hunter first harvesting the deer, just, just like normal. You harvest it, you tag it, you field dress the deer. And then instead of taking it to your local processor, it may end up being your local processor, but we want you to then take that deer to one of our participating processors. You let that processor know that you're here to donate the deer to Hunter Sharing the Harvest. Uh, the processor is going to have you fill out a donor receipt, which is basically a three-part receipt where we're just capturing information about you, contact information so that we can stay in touch with you and communicate with you after the fact. We want to collect some data about when the deer was harvested, what the method of take was, was it a buck or a doe, where it was harvested, all of that good data that just, again, helps quantify uh, the impact of our mission. So you basically fill out that donor receipt and that's it. You walk away. You don't have any financial commitment to the processing of that deer as the hunter. That's our job. We're going to pay the processor for, for processing each one of those deer. So at that point, the hunter has done their good. You fill out that donor receipt and walk away. The processor is then going to take all of that usable venison and grind it into burger because that's frankly the most efficient way to distribute that deer meat uh, throughout the food system. So they're gonna then package that burger into one, two, or sometimes large five pound packages of burger depending on how it's gonna be used. And then the processor will contact either their local uh, regional food bank or a local food pantry, soup kitchen, thing of that nature, uh, or maybe their local area coordinator who will help kind of run interference for them and pick up that venison so they can move it out of their freezers. Uh, and at that point, it gets distributed out to those uh, food assistance agencies. They then distribute it to their clientele, and the whole process has really been complete at that point in time. Then at the end of the season, our processors will turn in a reimbursement form to me along with copies of each of those donor receipts, and then we reimburse them for each deer that they process. So it keeps the whole system working well. It keeps the uh, processors making money because we couldn't expect this, this uh, mission to work if we were asking those processors to also donate all that time and overhead and everything that's involved with processing so many deer. Talking about processors, where is the need currently not being filled? Well, it's kind of scattered throughout the state. We've just got certain counties, and I don't have them right at the tip of my fingers here, but uh, we have a, a couple of counties that might even be higher deer harvest counties, quite frankly, like I think of Warren County as an example that comes right to my head because I think of high deer harvest, but yet not having a participating processor there in that county. Uh, so we we desperately need them there. And on our website, we list each of the counties and where the participating processors are. So I always encourage people, whether they're a deer hunter that's interested in finding out where their processors are, or if they're processors themselves, to take a look at that map and find out where we have those gaps and see if you know someone that might be interested in participating with us, you know, because that's really uh, one of the one of the key 
uh, operational objectives that I have every day is just trying to increase the number of processors we have so that hunters don't have to travel very far at all to donate deer. And in some, some counties, we're very well equipped. Uh, Lancaster County, for instance, we're like the dollar general of venison donation. There, you can pretty much spin around and see a participating processor in Lancaster County. Uh, but in others, we just we just have more of a need. So uh, it's one of those things as an organization, we look at ways we can try to even help that industry out because it's been kind of contracting over the years. You've got a lot of generational family run processing businesses. So uh, similar to other businesses that are that are in that same model, sometimes the uh, the younger generation that's preparing for for their career and what they want to do the rest of their lives might not be what dad and granddad did for the last 40 or 50 years, you know, so there's some of that issue at play. There's a lot of cost issues that processors have and and just different factors finding good good employees, a good steady workforce can be an issue for them. So so we look at that industry and think of, you know, how can we kind of help moving forward to to encourage and kind of fill a pipeline with potential entrepreneurs that want to to be deer processors down the road. So so we're into a lot of that type of thing too, working with people like the Department of Education and the Department of Ag and Penn State that has a uh, a deer a meat processing program to talk to them about, you know, ways we can get the meat cutting trades in front of students. Uh, when they're thinking about what they're going to do post-secondary education or adult learners that are looking for a new skill. In Pennsylvania, it's kind of hard to throw a pine cone and not hit a hunter. How do you get this information to the hands of the people that are going to be donating the meat? Uh, we use a lot of pretty much just grassroots marketing, to be quite honest with you. We don't do a whole lot of paid advertising or anything like that, but we have a great, great uh uh, relationship with the Pennsylvania Outdoor Writers Association and that that large group of journalists that includes everybody from folks that are writing newspaper articles to magazine articles to radio to podcasters like yourself and folks that have an interest in the outdoors and hunting in particular that that really support us and talk about what we're doing out there in the media. Uh, the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture have been tremendous, tremendous state level partners with us over the years, because both of them, they really see a shared interest with our mission when it comes to things like managing the deer herd. And in the case of the Department of Agriculture, they're concerned about things like feeding people. Uh, they're concerned with the food assistance system in Pennsylvania. And of course, they represent hunters who obviously have issues with crop damage from deer and so forth. So those two agencies help us with funding. They help us with our communication efforts. Uh, the Game Commission, especially when it comes to communications, has just been really phenomenal in recent years. They're developing quite a, a marketing and communications team there that's doing good on social media and with their publications like the Game News and the website and just a general very good outreach program. So a lot of these things are helping us. And then we really rely on a large group of what I call our, our volunteer field staff out there, which are our area coordinators that are volunteers for the program that just have a passion for what we're doing and they might have a, a gift for communication. They're comfortable talking to groups. They're comfortable talking one-on-one -on -one with people that might be potential supporters of the organization. They're out there uh, helping us recruit processors and just basically spreading the word about what we're doing here in, in Pennsylvania. And then of course we have our own social media platforms and a very good website that has a lot of information, pretty much anything you want to know about the program. So we're kind of doing everything the old fashioned way, but trying to take advantage of all the uh, the new media opportunities that are available out, out there without spending a lot of money. <laughs> Let's stay with the processors. At what point do you check for chronic wasting disease and issues that uh, affect the meat directly? So the way we handle chronic wasting disease is we have for a number of, well, basically since it became an issue here in Pennsylvania, we've had a protocol in place that says, we're gonna err on the side of safety at all costs. So although there's been no connection between CWD and humans ever shown to date, we want to make sure that the public is comfortable with the fact that any deer that are donated through our program are going to be free of CWD. And the way that we guarantee that is by asking the processors to quarantine any meat that comes from deer 
that were harvested in one of the disease management areas here in Pennsylvania that the Game Commission has defined and that has special rules and regulations for how you handle those deer. So what our processors do is they quarantine that meat if it came from a DMA. The hunter is then responsible to have a head test performed on that deer to confirm that it is negative for CWD. And when that test comes back as a not detected result, then they inform the processor, let them have a copy of whatever communication they have or a screenshot from, from the website where they looked up their, their account on the portal to where it shows that negative result. And then at that point, the processor is free to, to distribute that venison out to the public. So we've made sure at that point that any deer uh, that are donated here before they hit the food system are going to be free of CWD. And if in the case, and I can't even think of a case since I've been on board in the last two and a half years where we have had a positive uh, CWD test come back, but if that happens while that deer meat's quarantined, then the processor is just going to dispose of that deer meat uh, per the regulations and procedures that they have in place to handle that, that product. So that's how we handle CWD in the state. Um, for the last five, six, seven years now, uh, it's pretty pretty much just been confined to processors within the DMAs because the rules up until this year have been that deer harvested within a DMA had to stay within that DMA. So in other words, if I were an Erie County hunter and I was hunting down in Somerset County, for instance, that was in a DMA, when I would harvest a deer, I'd have to find a processor down there to have that deer processed. Meanwhile, I'm back home in Erie. Uh, two weeks later when I get the call that my deer meat's ready, so then I'd have to travel back to Somerset to pick up that deer meat. So it became quite a hassle uh, for the hunters. The Game Commission has relaxed that rule this season so that hunters can take the deer out of the DMA as long as they take it to a processor that is approved by the Game Commission and they're working hard. They've already got quite an extensive list of those processors. Most of our processors are already on that list or working to get on that list. But basically what that does for our program this year that I've had to just communicate with each of our processors that haven't been affected by this in the past, that they will now have to follow this same protocol that the processors in the DMAs have been following for these last several years. So it becomes a bit of a hiccup when you have processors that just don't have very much freezer space. So it's not easy for them to quarantine deer meat and wait for sometimes a month or so to get test results back. So in those cases, you know, we have given them the option to opt out of being able to accept deer from the DMAs if that's the case, uh, because we recognize the, the difficulties that they have with that type of thing. So in those cases, we're going to list on our website with each of those processors if they're not able to take deer from the DMAs. So at the same time, we're looking at things like a potential pilot program where maybe we would uh, source a local a uh, reefer truck or large freezer or something, walk-in freezer that we could locate somewhere centrally that some of our processors could find the space to quarantine meat while we're awaiting head test results and so forth. So we're looking at contingencies there. Uh, I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna be an overwhelming issue for us this year. I think overall the change in the rules are going to make it easier on everybody. It's going to take a lot of the strain off of the processors in the DMAs. It's going to make it easier on hunters in general. And our processors are just going to roll with this change. And, you know, the ones that can continue to take deer from DMAs will do that. And the ones that can't, they won't this year. And if they find out next year that the impact wasn't so bad and maybe they could have taken them, then we'll revisit next year. And for the listeners, if you're interested, we did a great episode with Todd Pride from the Pennsylvania Game Commission all about chronic wasting disease. So you can check that out. Let's dig in a little bit more about where the donated meat goes and who it helps. What can you tell us about that? Sure. So the way we do that is we ask the processors when they have venison that they need to have picked up, and that's really at their discretion. Some some processors might be able to stockpile a few hundred pounds of venison before they need it moved out of their freezers, but more typically, most of these processors are moving a lot of volume through at every given time once the once the arrows start flying and the bullets start flying in November. Uh, so what we do then is we ask them to either call their local uh, food pantry, soup kitchen, or one of the regional food banks here in Pennsylvania to have that deer meat picked up, and then that'll be distributed out through their clientele. Or a lot of times, one of our volunteer coordinators, our area coordinators in that area, 
will come pick the meat up and then they'll take it out. And maybe if they've got three or 400 pounds of venison, they might take it to two or three different uh, food assistance agencies and distribute it that way. But the nice thing about it is one way or another, when a hunter donates a deer, they can rest assured that that venison is gonna stay very close to their community. A lot of times it's gonna stay right in their community because in a lot of cases that processor already has a relationship with a local food bank or food pantry, uh, soup kitchen, you know, and they'll just call them up and immediately come running for that venison. Other times, if it goes to a regional food bank, it's still going to be distributed within that region, so it's going to stay very close to home. And the food banks are good at knowing uh, which one of their agencies can handle the venison, which ones need it the most, and so forth. So we let them kind of do their job at that point in time, but the processor just needs to get it to whoever they can as quickly as possible. And then we just ask them to keep track of all of that. Let us know how many pounds went to this regional food bank or to the local church or soup kitchen, you know, so that we can quantify again how well it was distributed, what the geographic distribution of that venison has been. What makes venison such a nutritious, healthy meat? Venison, as red meats go, is probably one of the, the leanest, highest protein meat sources that you can get. And when you talk to food banks around the state, the one thing that they really struggle for is good protein sources. A lot of them will tell you when it comes to protein, they rely on things like canned chicken, canned tuna, peanut butter, things like that, that form, that are a protein source, but they're not a real high value protein source. So the food banks and the vast majority of them absolutely love hearing that phone call from one of our processors that they've got venison ready to be picked up because they recognize the value of that venison to their clientele and the people that they're trying to feed. So venison is just, it's its a very high protein. It's very low in fat. So it makes it a very healthy option. And what we've even found is we've heard anecdotally from, from folks that have different health conditions, and I can't speak to what they might be, but it's been interesting to find, and I've even read some stories about this now since I've heard about it, uh, that some people just can't process meats that have a lot of fat. And, you know, whatever that condition might be or the reason might be, some of them can eat venison where they can't eat beef or pork, all because of that fat content and how their body deals with that. So it's kind of interesting that in a way, venison is almost like a, a superfood when it comes to red meats, if if you can qualify it as as that. It's about as good a meat product as you can get so and you you know you think about the fact that in in high-end restaurants in new york city people might be paying 40 or 50 dollars a plate just to enjoy a meal of venison and when we can supply that as a donated food source to to people that need it it's just it's super rewarding what kind of meals are made using the donated venison is there a popular one or something that a lot of food kitchens might want to use well, food kitchens are going to typically utilize that venison in a way that it's going to go the furthest. So basically, you're dealing with a ground burger product. And quite frankly, uh, you know, I'll get calls from people that maybe got a package of venison because that's typically the way this happens. It's either going to be distributed uh, to families in the packaged form that it came from the processor so they can take it home and feed their family or it's gonna be used in a large feeding in a soup kitchen type of format where they're feeding maybe 100 or 200 people in an evening. So really it runs the gamut, but this burger will be used in things like uh, chili, sloppy joes, spaghetti sauce mix, just all of those things that you might think of that would typically be uh, utilizing a burger product, tacos, things of that nature. And again, things that will go a long way when it comes to a feeding. Um, and we tell people too that this burger can be treated just like you would treat regular hamburger. Uh, people will call me and ask if they need to mix it with anything or if they need to do anything spe special to season it or whatever. And I just tell them, prepare it just like you would the same pound of burger at, in your home. You might find that uh, you want to do something a little different with it the next time. If you do taste what you might some people consider it a gamey taste, although most people will acknowledge that it's really not so much that it's a gamey taste, because how do you define gamey? It's really just the fact that it doesn't necessarily taste exactly like hamburger from beef, 
that you're used to. So it just has a different flavor. I've never found it to be uh, an objectionable flavor, and most people don't think so either. And especially when you're using it in a recipe of some sort, uh, I don't think the average person even notices the difference when they're eating venison over over hamburger, other than the fact that it's a lot uh, leaner and has a lot less fat to drain off and that type of thing. Yeah, I feel like venison chili is just such a classic recipe. No, no matter the season, it's just so good. Absolutely. What's the response from those that are actually receiving the venison from food banks? Do they really enjoy it? Do they want more? Do they kind of focus on certain aspects of how they want to use it? I think just across the board, the the folks that are in need in this state, and we have 1.5 million people that are what we consider food insecure in Pennsylvania. When they receive that venison product, I think they are just so overwhelmingly appreciative of being able to receive that deer meat that they, I, I've never heard a complaint. I haven't once heard one person complain, but we sure do hear a lot of stories about people just saying how much they appreciated that because they might have been visiting that same soup kitchen or or food pantry for months and not been able to secure good protein for their families. And when when there's suddenly a freezer full of one and two pound packages of venison, they're just over the moon elated with the with the opportunity to feed their families with that. So for me, it's just been tremendously rewarding to to be able to actually see the impact of this organization around the state uh, and how we are impacting people's lives. I mean, you just think about that 1.24 million servings and it's hard to it's hard to argue with the fact that Pennsylvania hunters are really making a difference in the hunger issue here in Pennsylvania. While deer is your main source of donated meat, you accept other animals, is that right? Uh, we do accept basically anything in the deer family. So really in Pennsylvania, typically what we're gonna see are gonna be white-tailed deer. Uh, we do occasionally get elk donated. We actually had four elk donated last year, which was, I think, probably the most elk we've ever received. And I love when I hear from one of our processors that they got an elk in because that tells me they're getting about, you know, probably five to six times as much meat out of that elk as they would have gotten out of a deer at least. So uh, it goes a long way and it's another very good high quality meat. So uh, but we get a lot of calls. People want to know if we can take bear meat or if we can take uh, other small game animals or or ducks and geese and things of that nature. And really, the reason we we don't accept other meat forms, and some states do, uh, they may have figured out a way to to handle this. But for us, it always comes down to the public safety and being able to really certify. Uh, how that meat was processed. So when it comes to something that's typically going to be processed by the hunter, like small game and waterfowl and things of that nature, we just don't know how well it was handled. We don't know if it was done in a nice sanitary way or whether it was cooled down quickly after being harvested before the meat started to taint. You know, there's just so many factors there that we can't control under those circumstances that we've just taken the stance that uh, at this point, those other items we're not going to be able to accept. And when it comes to bear meat, I think the biggest issue there isn't so much from, from the handling standpoint, because that's typically going to be uh, handled by a processor, just like it just like it would deer meat and so forth. But, but with bear, it's just such a different meat to prepare. Uh, it's probably not as easy to deal with as a ground product and so forth. So it's just something that we've, we've chosen over the years not to accept bear meat. It's not to say that that may not happen somewhere down the road, but at this point, uh, it's basically your deer family animals that we're we're accepting here in Pennsylvania. Where can people learn more about the program and where can they learn about donating? So the very best resource you can you can go to is our website. And it's a real easy one to remember. It's sharedeer.org. And it really has everything you want to know, everything from down to being able to see a, a map of the counties and what processors are available in each county. Uh, we encourage people to call some of these processors ahead of time if you're going to be hunting in a certain county or you live in a certain county, um, just to find out when they're taking deer and so forth. Some of them have some specific hours or days that they're accepting deer. You might want to get familiar with their Facebook pages and things like that, because a lot of times they'll be giving updates throughout the season saying, you know, we're full today, can't accept any more deer until tomorrow or till Monday or whenever it might be. So I always tell people, find your processors, 
ahead of time, do a little planning, just like you plan for the hunt and think about those things that you need to have in mind when it comes to where you're going to take the deer and how you're going to be prepared to, to keep it cold and keep it well maintained until it gets to the processor. So at any rate, the website has that information. It has information on ways people can help us. Obviously, we're a 501c3 charitable organization, and really the way our whole mission works is by us reimbursing processors for their services. So as the increase in popularity to our program uh, and the increased donations that we see each year, along come those higher reimbursement costs. And just to put it in perspective, this past season when we had that record-breaking year, those 235,000 pounds of venison came at a reimbursement cost of right around $400,000, which uh, is still a deal when you think about that on a per pound breakdown, what we're paying for reimbursing those processors for their services. But as we want to continue to expand and have another 500 or 1,000 more deer harvested each year, I'm always doing the math and thinking, okay, so how many, <laughs> how many thousands more dollars do we need to raise to be able to fund that? So we're always looking for people that want to support us, whether it be corporations as sponsors or individuals that might just want to give an amount that's comfortable for them just to help support our mission. The other thing we're always looking for, like I had mentioned, is our volunteer coordinators. I always say we can't have too many volunteer coordinators out there. So there's an interest form you can fill out on our website uh, if you have a passion for what we're doing and want to help us in your area. There's information on CWD. There's handouts with data just really everything you want to know about our program and how it works on that website. And that's sharedeer.org. Well, Randy, I hope you have many more record-breaking years. Thanks so much for being able to talk to us. We really appreciate it. I absolutely appreciate the opportunity. I love what you're doing with this podcast, and I'm glad we were able to come on and speak. I want to thank my guest, Randy Ferguson, for joining the podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook for more information about upcoming episodes. You can support the podcast by buying merch or donating on our website. This has been Hemlocks the Hellbenders. I'll see you out there. Hosting, production, and editing by Christian Alexanderson. Music by John Sauer. Graphics by Uncle Traveling Matt's Random Expedition. <laughs>